Sony A6700 is undoubtedly Sony's best APS-C camera to date, and there's a lot to love about this camera. Now, I was lucky enough to get my hands on a lone copy for a few weeks, and although my experience was largely very positive, I also noticed that there were a few things about this camera which aren't immediately obvious and could ultimately mean that this isn't the right choice for you. And let's face it, there's nothing worse than spending a bunch of money on a new camera only to find issues with it afterwards and make you regret your life choices. So hopefully this video will avoid that from happening to you. Firstly, I want to talk about the size, because one thing Sony is super keen on telling everyone, apparently, is that their line of APS-C cameras are smaller and lighter than full-frame cameras. And I think that this is certainly one of the most appealing factors to owning an APS-C camera, because having a smaller and lighter camera is just way more comfortable to carry around with you and to work with for longer periods of time. Now, whilst this camera is certainly smaller than most, it's not until you actually compare it side by side to other cameras that you realise that the reduced size isn't quite as dramatic as it's sometimes made out to be. For example, when placed next to my full-frame Sony A7 Mark IV, you can see that it's only really the top-mounted EVF that's sticking up by about two centimetres or three quarters of an inch that makes it slightly larger. Sony has actually been quite clever with the styling of this A6700 and they've added this little bevel section at the back, which kind of fools your eye into thinking that this APS-C camera is much thinner than it really is. As for weight, there's not a massive difference here either. With only a 166 gram or 5.86 ounce difference between the A7 Mark IV and this A6700. And to put that into context, that's less than the weight of most modern day smartphones. So I guess the point I'm making here is that whilst on paper, this is certainly a smaller and lighter camera than most, just be careful not to let this fact blind you into completely writing off larger cameras, because honestly, the difference just isn't as big of a deal as you might think. Okay, so let's talk about handling now, because I've got to say, Sony have really gotten a lot of things right. I'm a huge fan of the larger hand grip that they've added. It's super comfortable, even if you have big hands like me. The addition of the customizable dial on the front just makes it way easier now to adjust the aperture and the new switch around the mode dial makes it even quicker to change between shooting photo or video. Now, I've got to admit the touchscreen on this thing is probably one of the most responsive I've ever used on a camera. Usually, I'll be honest, that's the first thing that I deactivate on a camera because either I just find they're too inaccurate or a little bit unresponsive and that's certainly not the case here. You can now swipe the screen to reveal or hide additional settings, which means you can basically operate the camera entirely using the screen rather than having to use the physical buttons if you really want to. Though, just like previous models, there's still no joystick, which I know for a lot of people, myself included, is the preferred method of quickly moving around the AF point and just generally navigating around the camera settings. Even its two biggest rivals, the Fujifilm XS20 and the Canon R7, both have joysticks, so I do think it's a slight oversight by Sony by not having this included. The good news is that there are a few different workarounds. Firstly, if you just tap the center button on the D-pad, you can use the D-pad to control the active AF point, which works fine, though it is still slower than most joysticks. And I did find that on occasion, I would think I'd press the middle button, but hadn't pressed it, and then I'd end up just trying to change some of the settings, which did get a bit annoying. So personally, I think the much better option is to dive into the settings menu and then set the touch screen so that it works even whilst you have the EVF raised to your eye. And this means you can then move the AF point by simply dragging your thumb around the screen, which works a lot like a joystick would. You can even set it so that the left-hand side of the screen isn't touch sensitive, and I found this super helpful because it prevents the AF point from jumping all over the place if your cheek accidentally rubs up against the screen. Of course, if you're not using the EVF, you can simply just tap on the screen to focus, and that works absolutely fine. Though one thing I did take completely for granted until I actually started using this camera was just how much I appreciate being able to shoot one-handed. If I'm taking a photo of something quite close up, like a flower for instance, and I just want to move it slightly or reposition some of the leaves, I can easily just reach out with my left hand and do that. But the problem is when you have your left hand constantly glued to the touchscreen because you need it to recompose the AF points, you can't do that anymore, at least not quite as easily. Not to keep banging on about it, but this again is where having a joystick comes in really handy because you can just move the AF point around with your thumb, lock the focus and take the shot all with your right hand. Now, just to clarify, I am not saying that there is anything intrinsically wrong with how this camera operates, but just consider that moving the AF point around is something you have to do a lot if you're taking photos or capturing video. It is definitely important to make sure that the camera you're buying handles the way that you want it to, otherwise it will end up getting annoying. Anyway, speaking of AF, let's now talk about some of the AI-driven AF tools on this thing, because it hands down offers some of the best autofocus features of any Sony APS-C camera. As you may know, Sony have packed this thing with some of the fancy AI features that were first shown on the Sony A7R Mark V, which includes better focus tracking, not only for people, but insects, birds, planes, cars, and much more. It also includes an auto crop mode for video capture, which automatically punches in and frames up the shot as you move around, which is obviously quite handy if you need to film yourself and you don't 
don't have any friends to help you out. But obviously I wouldn't know what it's like to not have any friends. <laughs> I'm so lonely. Now all of that sounds great and it is great. It all works as well as you would expect. But the only thing I would say about all this stuff is that it is really easy to get dazzled by new and exciting tech. And when buying a camera, you do need to be honest with yourself and ask, are you actually gonna use or benefit from having any of these features? If it's extremely unlikely that you'll need the ability to track a butterfly, for example, then why pay a premium for tech you'll never use? Now, if you're a hybrid shooter, then the likelihood is that the main draw for this camera is the improved video specs. And I'm talking about the ability to shoot 4K, 10 bit, and up to 120 frames per second, which is all pretty awesome. This is particularly exciting if you're upgrading from a previous Sony APS-C camera, because going from 8-bit to 10-bit footage is a pretty significant jump in terms of image quality. But obviously the downside here is that in order to film in 4K at 120 frames per second, there is the additional 1.5x crop to consider. Now, as this is an APS-C camera, your lenses are already going to be subject to a 1.5x crop anyway. So to factor in another 1.5x crop on top of this does play havoc with your focal lens a bit. For example, a 20 millimeter lens on this camera would roughly equate to a 30 millimeter lens in full frame terms. But when you shoot in 4K at 120 frames per second, that extends it further by another one and a half times crop to give you something closer to a 45 millimeter lens. So all of a sudden your wide angle is not all that wide. Plus this extreme crop will affect the appearance of your bokeh too. For example, shooting with the 20 millimeter at f1.8, the end result will look something closer to a 45 millimeter lens set to f4 when shot on a full frame camera. Two plus two is four, minus one, that's three quick maths. Now just to prove that point, here is a side by side with the left footed shot on the a6700 with that 20 millimeter lens at f1.8 at 4K, 120 frames per second. And then the shot on the right was captured with my full frame Sony a7 Mark IV with a 45 millimeter focal length at f4. Now just to clarify, the crop doesn't affect the amount of light actually entering the camera. You're still gonna get the same amount of light coming in at f1.8 as you always did. It's just the appearance of the bokeh that won't appear quite as thick. Now obviously if you don't care too much about every single shot having a super shallow depth of field, then this probably won't bother you at all. But if you're a bokeholic, then this could make the idea of shooting at 120 frames per second a little less appealing. Also, as a final point to touch on, this camera does have a micro HDMI port rather than a full size one, which I know a lot of people are upset about because micro HDMI cables are way easier to break. I should know, I've broken plenty of them myself, it's easily done and quite annoying. But personally, I don't feel too bad about this because with the exception of the FX30, which is a dedicated cinematography camera, all of the other competitors to this camera do use micro HDMI as well. So it's not like we're being shortchanged by Sony. So after all of that, should you buy the A6700? Well, if none of what we've talked about has put you off in any way, shape or form, then absolutely you should consider buying this camera. Because when all is said and done, this is still one of the most impressive APS-C cameras on the market right now, and certainly the best APS-C camera that Sony has ever released. However, if I have managed to sow even just the slightest seed of doubt in your mind that this might not be the camera for you, then here are a few of the cameras that I would recommend looking into as alternative options. The first is the predecessor to this camera, the A6600. If you really don't think you're going to use any of the fancy new features included on the A6700, like 10-bit 4K video and improved AF tracking, then this is still a solid option and will save you a decent chunk of cash. Alternatively, if you're mainly a video shooter and maybe only take photos very rarely, you might be better off getting the FX30. It is a little bit more expensive, priced around $1,800, but essentially it has the same internals as this A6700, just with a more video-focused button layout and design. There's no EVF on it, but it does have a proper heatsink, so overheating is just not going to be a problem. Plus, it does have a full-sized HDMI port. Now, looking outside of the world of Sony, I would recommend looking at the Fujifilm XS20, as its price and specs are very close to the A6700. It includes 7-stop IBIS, subject detection AF modes, and 10-bit 4K video recording. The 4K video is capped at 60 frames per second, and that's with a 1.5 times crop. However, it does also give the option for open gate recording using the entire sensor for 6.2K 10-bit footage up to 30 frames per second. Anyway, if you found this video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you could hit the like button just to please the YouTube algorithm gods. And while you're down there, hit the subscribe button for more content just like this.